Welcome to episode 4 of series on travels of Ibn Battuta. In this episode, we will look into Ibn Battuta's travel through Egypt, Palestine and Syria of Mamluk Sultanate. If you have not completed the previous episodes, we suggest you do so before starting today's episode. Ibn Khaldun, an Arab scholar of Islam, social scientist, philosopher and historian who has been described as the founder of the modern disciplines of historiography, sociology, economics, and demography, once said. As for the dynasties of our time, the greatest of them is that of the Turks in Egypt. With that said let's dive into today's episode. Out of the many global ports, Ibn Battuta visited throughout his movements, Alexandria dazzled him as among the five generally heavenly. There was not one harbor but rather two, the eastern saved for Christian ships, the western for Muslim. Alexandria dealt with an extraordinary assortment of Egyptian items, including the woven silk, cotton, and cloth from its own flourishing material shops. All the more significantly, it was the most westerly arranged of the curve of Middle Eastern urban communities that piped exchange between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. Ibn Battuta had the favorable luck to make his first and lengthiest visit to Egypt during a period of high success on the Zest course running from the Indian Ocean to the Red Sea and subsequently down the Nile to the ports of the Delta. The Turkish talking heroes known as Mamluks administered Egypt, Palestine and Syria as a united realm from 1250 to 1517. Throughout the second half of the 13th century, the Mamluks had been obliged to do battle a few times to keep Persia's Mongol armed forces from invading Syria and progressing to the Nile. At the port of Adab mostly up the Red Sea, Ibn Battuta went through half a month in the bustling port, seeing the sights, counting the Pharos beacon and the 3rd century marble section known as Pompey's Pillar, and blending in with the men of letters in the mosques and universities. In the Rila Ibn Battuta describes the accomplishments and wonders of a few researchers and spiritualists of the city, a large portion of them of Maribi birthplace. At a certain point, he put in a couple of days as the visitor of one Buran al-Din the Lame, a loved Sufi saint. Among the exceptional abilities of more illuminated Muslim divines was the endowment of predicting what's to come. In Buran al-Din's organization that the youthful pioneer, Ibn Battuta got the main blueprint of his destiny. The sacred man, seeing that Ibn Battuta had energy for movement in his heart, proposed that he visit three of his kindred Sufis, two of them in India, the third in China. Ibn Battuta recalls the incident as I was amazed at his prediction, and the idea of going to these countries having been cast into my mind, my wanderings never ceased until I had met these three that he named and conveyed his greeting to them. Ibn Battuta wandered in the valley of the Nile for a while before heading to Cairo. Ibn Battuta was in no particular hurry at this point because the next season of the Hajj was still about seven months off. Most young scholars might have made a direct destination for Cairo, the great metropolis. As Ibn Battuta developed a zeal to see everything. Thus, he spent about three weeks, probably during April 1326 wandering through the prosperous commercial and textile-producing towns of the Delta of Damanhur, Fuwa, Ibr, Damietta, Samanud, and others. En route, he searched out and stopped in the places of various adjudicators, intellectuals, and Sufi sheikhs, including a commended holy person of Fuwa who likewise forecasted that the young fellow would one day end up in India. At Samanud on the Damietta part of the waterway, he boarded one of the high-masted boats which swarmed the stream and cruised straightforwardly upstream toward Cairo. Ibn Battuta, a minority among pilgrims in his inability to make reference to the crocodiles, was intrigued by the sheer pound of humankind along the banks, a thickness of home and surprising difference to what he had seen crossing North Africa as mentioned in Rila. There is no need for a traveler on the Nile to take any provision with him, because whenever he wishes to descend on the bank he may do so for ablutions, prayers, purchasing provisions, or any other purpose. There is a continuous series of bazaars from the city of Alexandria to Cairo. Cities and villages succeed one another along its banks without interruption and have no equal in the inhabited world, nor is any river known whose basin is so intensively cultivated as that of the Nile. There is no river on earth but it which is called a sea. For all their overflowing life. 
The market towns coating the lower Nile were nevertheless unimportant impressions of what the traveler viewed on arriving at Cairo, the most amazing marketplace of all. Explorers of the time, whatever their beginning, stood intrigued at the city's overwhelming size. Present-day researchers recommend Cairo's populace in the principal half of the 14th century may have been somewhere in the range of 500,000 and 600,000, or multiple times bigger than Tunis and multiple times bigger than London in a similar period. In spite of the fact that Cairo was spreading actually in a few ways in the mid-14th century, most of the populace, including unfamiliar guests and displaced people, lived stuffed inside the walled city which lay about a mile and a half east of the stream. This was Cairo appropriately named, al Kahira, the Victorious. The home inside walled Cairo was so thick and the flood of mankind so big that the city resembled being radically overpopulated. The smash of individuals, camels, and jackasses in the focal business area was incredible to such an extent that Ibn Battuta may have discovered a tourist stroll around the Bay and al Khazrian, the principal road an altogether nerve-tearing experience. There were a large number of shops in the region of the road, just as in excess of 30 business sectors, everyone a centralization of a specific art or exchange, butchers, goldsmiths, jewel vendors, candle makers, craftsmen, ironsmiths and different others. The focuses of worldwide exchange the city were the caravansaries, called fundics or cons. These were some of the time monstrous and amazingly enriched structures worked around the focal yard and containing rooms on the ground floor for putting away products and higher up for housing dealers. A few cons were built for specific gatherings of unfamiliar merchants, for example, Marabis, Persians, or Europeans. A caravansary for Syrian shippers worked in the 12th century had 360 lodgings over the storerooms and enough space for 4,000 visitors all at once. At the point when Ibn Battuta entered the Mamluk space, he fell under a political power whose relationship to everybody was very not normal for what he had known at home. Though the Marinids of Morocco were of Berber origin, ethnically undifferentiated from the vast majority of the neighborhood populace, the Mamluks were, in their Central Asian birthplaces, Turkish language, and military ethos, absolutely strange to their local Egyptian subjects. Ibn Battuta had the luck to show up in Cairo at the victorious midpoint of Sultan al-Nasir Muhammad ibn Khalan, who administered from 1293 to 1341, longer than any ruler in the 267 years of the Mamluk system. The rule of al-Nasir Muhammad was Cairo's age at its most radiant when the city bloomed into development as the world capital of Arab craftsmanship and letters. While the Mongol swarm scoured its way through the Middle East, Destroying Baghdad and ravaging Damascus between 1299 to 1300, Cairo offered a safe shelter for researchers, experts and rich dealers who were sufficiently deaf to escape across the Sinai Peninsula, taking with them the information, creative abilities, and abundance that aided make Cairo the most cosmopolitan focus of a culturated culture any place in the Dar al-Islam. Rents and taxes from a large number of peasants filled the city. They were sumptuously exhausted on strict enrichments, just as on castles, cons, racetracks, canals, and mausoleums, creating in all the most vivacious flood of building that Cairo had ever known. During Ibn Battuta's visit of about a month in the city, he visited the landmarks of the Mamluks, just as the mosques and tombs of prior dynasties. Among the designs which most dazzled Ibn Battuta was the Maristan, or medical clinic, worked by Kalan and archetype of al-Nasir. It was one of the best engineering manifestations of the age. The schools were the essential communities of scholarly and city life wherein the strict, social, and social standards administering Egyptian culture were instructed and exemplified. A madrasa was indeed a mosque, however one planned essentially for instructing instead of for congregational petition. As the city developed and flourished new universities jumped up in a steady progression, enough of them by the 14th century to make Ibn Battuta's remark that with respect to the madrasas in Cairo, they are an excessive number of for anybody to tally. The Mamluk age universities were planned on a cruciform arrangement with a generally little open patio, as opposed to the immense spaces inside the Bas congregational, or Friday, mosques. Opening onto the court were four vaulted corridors, or liwans, where classes were typically held. 
This was the exemplary madrasa type of Ibn Battuta's time, giving indeed the model to Marinid school working in Morocco. Studies in medication, stargazing, arithmetic, and reasoning were accessible and madrasas delivered scholars, jurisprudence, antiquarians, encyclopedists, and biographers of terrific learnedness and agility of psyche. It was these illuminating presences that Ibn Battuta, and many researchers like him from all through the Arabic, Persian, and Turkish-speaking Islamic world, went to the incredible city of Cairo to see and hear. Ibn Battuta may well have stayed in Cairo any longer than a month since toward the finish of the time there still stayed over five months before the beginning of the Hajj customs in Mecca. The authority Egyptian caravan, which went to the Hajjaz across Sinai under the Mamluk security, didn't for the most part leave Cairo until the center of the long stretch of Shawal, in that year mid-September. However, Ibn Battuta had a rashness about him as he had just exhibited in his excursion across North Africa, and he was not slanted to sit tight for convoys or individual voyagers for long. At last, he chose to continue to Mecca all alone, not by the Sinai course but rather via Upper Egypt to the Red Sea port of Adab and from that point by boat to Jeddah on the Hijaz coast. Pilgrims voyaged both the northern and southern courses out of Cairo in the first half of the 14th century. The Sinai Street was the more limited of the two, and it was generally safer on the grounds that the sultans supported yearly caravans and dispatched armed force units to keep up and guard the route. The southerly track to Adab and Jada was longer, and there was no authoritatively coordinated parade. This was the Spices route and in Ibn Battuta's time one of the busiest and deliberately most fundamental routes of global exchange in the Afro-Eurasian world. A pioneer could by and large hope to go right to Adab, situated close to the advanced Sudanese boundary, without passing past the range of Mamluk borders. The Sultan even posted posts in Kuz, Idfu, Aswan, and other significant towns along the river. Ibn Battuta's a multi-week venture up the Nile Valley to the town of Idfu was cultivated absent a lot of experience. He went via land instead of on the waterway, and at a few focuses, on route he held up in the homes, schools, or cabins of researchers and Sufis. While going through the town of Minya, he got entangled in a minor episode, intriguing for what it uncovers of his high feeling of cultivated respectability, just as a less engaging tendency to hypocritical intruding as referenced in Rila by Ibn Battuta. One day I entered the bathhouse in this township, and found men in it wearing no covering. This appeared a shocking thing to me, and I went to the governor and informed him of it. He told me not to leave and ordered the lessees of, all, the bathhouses to be brought before him. Articles were formally drawn up, then and there, making them subject to penalties if any person should enter a bath without a waist trapper, and the governor behaved to them with the greatest severity, after which I took leave of him. Ibn Battuta proceeded to Infu, one of the central transhipment communities for the overland take to the coast. Here he crossed toward the east bank of the waterway, recruited camels, and set out for Adab in the organization of a gathering of Bedouin Arabs. Their journey southeastward through the desert and afterwards over the exposed and seething Red Sea hills required 15 days, about the ordinary time for the journey. Prior to when Ibn Battuta went through the town of Hu on the Nile, he visited a righteous Sharif, Abu Muhammad Abdallah al Hassani. After knowing about the Ibn Battuta's aim to go to Mecca, the Sharif cautioned him to get back to Cairo, forecasting that he would not make his first journey besides by the way through Syria. But, Ibn Battuta overlooked the sign and proceeded on his path toward the south toward Zadab. Yet, after arriving at Adab, he found that the nearby ruling family, a faction of the Beja individuals who possessed the slopes behind the city, were in rebellion against the Mamluk governor. The rebels had sunk a few boats in the harbor driven out the Egyptian post, and in this environment of brutality, nobody was lifting sail for Jidda. Subsequently, if Ibn Battuta were to be guaranteed of arriving at the Hijaz before the beginning of the Hajj, he had no genuine decision except for to return to Cairo and proceed from that point by one of the northern courses. Luckily, the journey back didn't take long. The Nile was arriving at summer flood stage. Thus in the wake of intersection the desert again and rejoining the stream at Kus, 
Ibn Battuta boarded a boat and got back to Cairo in eight brief days by mid-July. Ibn Battuta remained in Cairo, just for one night prior to setting out for Syria, the Asian portion of the Mamluk domain. Cairo's fundamental course to Damascus was the realm's imperial street since Damascus was a sort of second capital after Cairo. It was liable for the guard against the Mongols of Persia. Damascus was as extraordinary a city as Cairo in the creation of extravagance merchandise. Egypt's military rulers relied vigorously upon the processions from Syria for their fine silks and brocades, their ceramics in China, their wonderful tents and pony features, these articles exchanged essentially for Egyptian materials and grain. Damascene craftsmen, for example, artisans, marble laborers, and plasterers, oftentimes went with the parades to Cairo to work in the development of castles, tombs, and mosques. In the event that Ibn Battuta had gone to Mecca with the Egyptian Hajj procession, he would have traversed the landmass to Aqaba, at that point toward the south end of the Hydras. All things being equal, he set a northeastward course through the eastern deltas cultivating towns and from that point along the sandy Mediterranean plain to Gaza, the desert gateway to Palestine. Up and down the course, the public authority gave public caravansaries where, as indicated by the Rila, explorers land with their beasts, and outside every khan is a public watering place and a shop at which the voyager may purchase what he needs for himself and his beast. The path along the sloping spine of Palestine, from Hebron to the Galilee, was not a huge business street, but rather it was a course of journey for every one of the three monotheistic religions. Hebron was unique to Muslim, Christian, and Jew the same since it was the entombment spot of the fathers of monotheism, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just as their spouses and Jacob's child Joseph. In the Rila ibn Battuta depicts the mosque, a huge stone design of striking excellence and forcing tallness, just as the cenotaphs remaining inside, as a voyager of any confidence would see them today. Ibn Battuta additionally offers learned declaration to the reality of the custom that the three graves do for sure lie underneath the mosque, a convention checked by Frankish knights, who opened the collapse 1119 and found what were probably the sacred bones. Hebron's distance to Jerusalem through the terraced Judean slopes was just 17 miles, and Ibn Battuta made the outing. Jerusalem was a position of innumerable hallowed places and asylums. For Christians the profound focal point of the city was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for Jews it was the western wall of the sanctuary, the Wailing Wall, and for Muslims, it was the Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary, worshipped as the third most honored spot in the Dar al-Islam, after the Kaaba in Mecca and the burial chamber of the Prophet in Medina. During Ibn Battuta's visit in the city of maybe seven days, he presumably spent a decent arrangement of his time in the Haram a far-reaching trapezoid-molded zone limited by structures and city dividers overwhelming the southeastern quarter of the city. The whole haram was itself a colossal mosque open to the sky, however inside it stood a few safe havens having explicit strict importance for Muslims. The most loved of these was the Qubba al skra the Dome of the Rock, a wondrously delightful structure set in the focal point of the haram on the site of the antiquated Temple of Solomon. This sanctum, dating from the 7th century, is looking like an ordinary octagon, lavishly ornamented with entwined Arabic scriptural citations and mathematical plans and conquered by an enormous vault. Inside the safe haven and straightforwardly underneath the dome lies inserted in the earth the favored rock of Zion. It was from here, it is told, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, moved at lightning speed from Mecca to Jerusalem in the organization of the angel Gabriel was carried on the rear of an incredible winged horse up to the seventh heaven of paradise, where he remained within the sight of God. In remembrance of Muhammad's night journey, Muslims enter the dome, make a circuit of the rock, and slide to the little cavern underneath it. Ibn Battuta makes reference to in the Rila some of the researchers and divines occupant in Jerusalem. One of these, a Sufi expert of the Rafai fraternity named Abd al-Rahman ibn Mustafa, took an uncommon premium in the youngster and was obviously dazzled enough by his truthfulness in figuring out how to give him a kirka, the woolen, fix-covered shroud worn by Sufi followers. Ibn Battuta's accurate course toward the north is unsure, 
yet he probably went through Nablus, Ilan, and the Galilean from that point across the Golan Heights to the Syrian capital. 26 This excursion was presumably cultivated in a couple of days since the whole outing from Cairo to Damascus. The Damascus that Ibn Battuta saw in 1326 was, similar to Cairo, a city during the time spent changing itself under the improvement of a political system that, at any rate for the present, had found some kind of harmony between unforgiving, strutting dictatorship and affection for humanized taste and solace. During part of his visit to the city, Ibn Battuta boarded in one of the three Maliki madrasas there. He may have genuinely masterfully carried out in the great mosque, sitting underneath the marble sections of the brilliant domed safe haven, surrounding him the mumbling voices of teachers and Quranic perusers and kids around and around recounting their hallowed exercises. The supplication lobby, a three-aisled nave in excess of 400 feet since quite a while ago, was open on its northern side and joined to a roomy court rimmed by arcades where, as indicated by the Rila, individuals of the city accumulate. In the nights, some perusing, some talking, and some strolling here and there. The staff of authorities appended to the mosque was gigantic, including, Ibn Battuta advises us, 70 muezzins, supplication guests, 13 imams, petition pioneers, and around 600 Quranic reciters. He portrays the safe haven as a position of constant strict and instructive action, an endless festival of God's magnificence and usefulness is referenced in Rila. The residents gather in it day by day, following the sunrise supplication, to peruse a seventh piece of the Quran. In this mosque additionally, there are a considerable number of sojourners who never leave it, involving themselves unremittingly in supplication and recitation of the Quran and sacraments. The townsfolk supply their necessities of food and garments, despite the fact that sojourners never ask for anything of the sort from them. Close to Cairo, Damascus had the best centralization of prominent scholars and law specialists in the Arabic talking world. A significant number of the displaced people from Baghdad and other Mesopotamian or Persian urban areas who had fled the Mongol tide. So the youthful researcher had before him a universe of illuminating presences from which he may pick his instructors. In the high-level educational program, the teacher normally read and offered a critique on an old-style book, at that point tried under study's capacity to discuss it just as comprehend its significance. Educators granted the individuals who played out an ijaza capability, or declaration, which qualified them to show a similar book to other people. In the Rila Ibn Battuta professes to have taken guidance and gotten ijazas from no under 14 distinct educators. Ibn Battuta makes reference to, specifically, his hearing perhaps the most worshipped messages in Islam, the Book of Sound Tradition of the Prophet, the Sahih, by the extraordinary 10th century researcher al Bukhari. Ibn Battuta additionally subtleties the fundamental data composed on his ijaza the chain of instructive authority connecting his own educator through various ages of sages back to al-Bukhari himself. This specific course of study, he advises us, occurred in the Great Mosque and was finished in 14 day-by-day -day meetings. Ibn Battuta spent long August hours in the cool of the old mosque retaining as much learning as possible and social event certifications that would contribute quite a while later to his arrangement as a Qadi to the Sultan of India. Thanks for listening to Episode 4 of our series on Travels of Ibn Battuta. Stay tuned for Episode 5 where we will look into his journey to Mecca.